Okay, this is uh, Cole Glenn from Durango. We're lucky to have him. He's going to show us a, a few patterns before, before dinner. Okay, great. Hello, everybody. Hi. How's everyone doing tonight? Good. Good, good. Well, thank you guys for having me tonight. I'm Cole Glenn. I'm with the San Juan Angler in Durango. I'll be talking about uh, all of our regional fisheries, um, the animus, the pine, the uh, um, San Juan, of course, and a lot of our tributaries and, and creeks up in the high country. Um, start off here with this first hour, just kind of talking about some of the flies that we have in the area. Uh, we do a lot of fishing on the San Juan River, which is uh, down in New Mexico, about an hour drive south of Durango. And that's, uh, of course, the tailwater. So we do a lot of uh, midge fishing down there. So a lot of like 20s, 22s, 24s, 26s, maybe 28s during the, the hot summer months when it's highly pressured and this, those fish are certainly um, keying in on, on that kind of thing. But um, we also have a lot of tailwaters, or I mean, excuse me, freestones. So we have a lot of, you know, caddis flies and uh, big stone flies and salmon flies even. So we kind of have a pretty diverse um, fisheries in the area. So what I was going to kind of do today was uh, just start with <clears throat> some smaller, you know, midge patterns. We do a lot of midge larvae, um, and it could be any color. It could be olive, could be brown, chocolate, you know, tan, uh, black, whatever. Um, we do a lot of like San Juan worm type flies, which is not your traditional San Juan worm. We do fish those, but we fish a much smaller uh, version of it called the span wan worm which is made with some span flex and then we uh, of course we fish a bunch of big bugs like the uh, girdle bug which is a salmon fly larva and uh, you know big drake nymphs and things like that big caddis fly nymphs but uh, I'm going to start off with uh, probably just some, some smaller um, midge patterns just to kind of get, get it going start with the, with the tougher ones and work up towards uh, the higher but uh, this is a great hook that we use a lot, it's a 2488H, um, which is a heavy style hook, size 22. Um, this one is a great kind of curved nymph hook for a lot of different midge patterns. And uh, you know, when you're, when you're fishing these smaller flies, it's really beneficial to have that extra heavy hook. So when you hook these you know, 20 plus inch fish on a size 22, you have a better chance of landing those fish when you do have that uh, that's real that, you know, that, that heavier strength gauge wire. And I'm assuming a lot of you folks do your own tie-in. Cool. So uh, I, I love to be you know um, kind of informal and questions so on the tie-in. If you guys have any questions please feel free to jump in ask me any questions you guys like or have. Um, probably going to start this one with orange thread here. <clears throat> you guys get a chance to come up to Durango much? Has anybody been up to Durango and fish that area, the San Juan in particular? A few? Not yet, well. So fish the end must behind the Walmart. Oh yeah, there you go. I've been to Durango, but not when I was fishing. Yeah, the Animus is, well, hopefully still is, but certainly was a fantastic fishery. We had that 416 fire last year, as you guys probably heard, and uh, we had uh, probably 80% fish kill on the Animus. We had this crazy rain, and it all came down and uh, ended up sort of blowing out the river. But it washed uh, all the ash from the fire into the river? Yeah, that's exactly it. It, it washed a lot of the ash out of the river. Uh, Mudslides, flash floods, and all that came down. And uh, if, it was, if it had been sort of a quick process, it probably would have been OK. But it was prolonged. We had a couple big rainstorms, and it was like that for about two weeks. And uh, those fish just weren't able to survive over that period of time. Co, what thread are you tying with? What's that? What thread are you tying with? Uh, I'm tying with a, uh, I think a 140 here. Um, it's a little bit heavier than I would probably typically use uh, for a midge. Um, I just kind of, kind of brought some of my, my, you know, minimal mm -hmm. supplies here today. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is just going to be a real basic midge larva. Um, a lot of these midges that we like to tie, we, um, you know, the, sometimes it's the simpler the better. A lot of times, you know, you can, you can make flies very complex and, and, and add to, you know, the, the value of them. 
but uh, a lot of times, especially on the San Juan where these fish see a lot of different patterns day in, day out, as it's a very heavily pressured fishery, uh, sometimes the more basic flies are the more uh, productive. Of course, you know, all these patterns have a variation on here where you can add flash, you can add, you know, wings, you can add different body colors, you can do tubing below, above. But I like, on the fish of the San Juan, you know, mids larva in orange, red, uh, you know, chocolate and black are probably the most, you know, the ones you'll see a lot of. But what I like to do here is uh, just really concentrate on the, the, uh, the ribbing. So all I'm doing is just wrapping this, this midge here in the orange tubing. I got a little pleat piece of uh, ultra wire and the extra small. I'm just gonna wrap the, wrap the body up here and then I'm gonna finish, finish the head of the fly. And instead of dubbing the head of the fly, and I like, I like these wraps to be you know, pretty consecutive and consistent, that's for sure. If you ever get a chance to see some of these midge larvae in the flesh, you'll be very surprised at how precise they are. Each body segment of those flies <clears throat> Cole, and, what's that ribbing material you're using? So this is called just it's just ultra wire uh, and extra small. So of course they have the, the extra small, small, brassy, medium, and large is the is the five sizes. Um, this is just the extra small, which is very very fine and a little bit challenging to kind of work with. Some of this material is a little bit tough, but you can see. It's, pretty well the the ribbing there at least and then uh, you know some of the some of these flies you can certainly go ahead and, and, and actually dub the the, sur the, uh, the the head of it what I like to do here is um, take a black permanent marker just kind of line the thread just a little bit right here at the very top and when I whip finish that's going to create that black head on that fly <clears throat> Cut this little wire off here. You guys do tie a lot of midge patterns? Good. Yep. Yeah, that's the, for, for the San Juan, it's the, the name of the game down there. And you can get, depending on the, the time of year and everything like that, you can certainly get fish on a lot of other patterns. But if you had just midge larva, all year long, you would do just fine down there. And that's a size 22? This is a size 22. Yep, and it's like a, I guess it's a, it's a well, this one's like a, it's a straight straight eye, but it's a, it's a 2X wide, which is, gives you that benefit of that wider hook. So when those fish take it, you have, you have that, that good opportunity to really plant that hook in there. 2X short, so it gives you that kind of that real midge larva look on it. Um, curved shank, but it's 2x, 2x heavy, and that's where you're going to be able to really have the benefit of land in some of those bigger fish. Because I, I've, I have tied and, and fished with other hooks that are, you know, a lot lighter, and all of a sudden you're fighting him, he's ripping down stream, and pink, oh, he broke me off. Of course, you reel it in, and boop, yeah, <laughs> your yeah. hook straightened up, right? So, yeah. so th these, uh, these 2488s are a great hook, and they actually have the 2488s. Uh, in just a regular, so it's not the H, it's not the heavy, it's just the regular, and it actually goes down, I think, to a size 26, or this one goes down to a size 24. So if you really need to tie those ultra small midge patterns, um, it's probably our number one, you know, hook that we use and hook that we sell for those really small midge patterns. But um, when you're fishing a pattern like that, are you fishing like tandem with? Yeah, typically. Else? Yeah, yeah we'll fish. Uh, <clears throat> Usually when I'm fishing on the Juan, uh, that's where I do most of my midge fishing. Uh, the San Juan, true tail water, you know, all that, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, there's a lot of mayflies and a lot of other patterns down there, but the, the, the midge is definitely the number one pattern down there. Um, I usually start off with the midge larva up top, like as my point fly, and then at the end down below, I, I'll fish RS2 or Jujubatus or something of that sort. 
Um, and that, de that depends on a lot on the time of year as well. If you're fishing <clears throat> maybe in the winter time, I might lead with a leech, like an olive or black or natural squirrel leech, and then you go down below to a midge larva. You know, red annelid is always a great choice down there. Um, it's just uh, a lot of variation. Sometimes it's, it's all depending on the color. Sometimes it's those guys are eating black. Other times they're eating chocolate. You know, a slight change. Other times they're eating tan or cream. Or sometimes they're on the miracle midge, which is more of a kind of a white fly. And it's just, you know, a lot of times it's just kind of a, you know, you, you fish a couple flies for 20, 30 minutes, see how you do. You change it up, two new flies. You go from black and red to olive and tan, and all of a sudden, boom, you got your first fish. Oh, he's on tan. Put the, put the second fly on tan, and it's tan, 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 tan. And then it'll go for a while, maybe 11, 12 o'clock, and then it'll kind of switch over to the next pattern. A lot of times in the afternoon, you get them on emergers. Uh, and uh, you know, even after then, you'll have a good opportunities to fish dry flies. The San Juan's kind of a cool, unique fishery in that sense that it's, you know, you can fish any method down there virtually any day of the year. You know, you can certainly nymph <coughs> midges all day, every day. You can throw leeches, egg patterns, you know, terrestrials as a dry down there. There's good opportunities for streamers down there. And in fact, they're, uh, today, this morning at 2 a.m., they started to release uh, the, spring, the spring release from Navajo Dam. So this morning, or yesterday, it was at 400. By the end of today, it should be at 2,000. And then by the end of tomorrow, it's going to bump up again into almost 4,000. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they're going to bump it up just small increments to 5,000. So we'll have 5,000 CFS by Friday. It should run for about five or six days, which is a little bit challenging fishing for sure because you have all this extra water in there and you're fishing way outside the, the river yeah. channel. But uh, <clears throat> you get a lot of opportunities to throw just like streamers. And you know, all of a sudden the water rises so quickly that these, you know, hoppers and crickets and beetles and stuff that were on the way away from the riverbank are now flooded so now they're food yeah. as well as you know baby mice and you know, anything else these fish are very opportunistic and they will certainly go after uh, anything and everything but um, yeah that's gonna happen now and uh, usually it's about the same time of year a couple couple weeks of high water uh, but once it drops back down to the target flow, which is somewhere between 500 and 1,000 CFS, it is the prime time to be down there. The two weeks after it does its flush and come back down, we've had some of our best fishing down there. Of course, it fishes well throughout the year, but these fish don't get the pressure. They get this you know, increase in food, and they eat like crazy. Don't see any anglers, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, they're big, fat, and happy, and uh, very unsuspecting of anglers so that'll be in the next couple of weeks that we'll, uh, we'll we'll be seeing that but um, that's that midge larva there um, like I said a very very basic pattern and I do have uh, a lot of these tied up right here on this uh, little manila envelope here in front some of them are red orange I got some olive ones I have some black ones whenever I do like a lighter color body I try to do a dark ribbing and then vice versa, if I do a dark body, I try to do like a silver or gold or maybe a red ribbing just to kind of make that contrast. Um, the next fly I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be doing is going to be basically this guy right here. This is called the span wan worm. It's a variation of the san wan worm. Like I said, like a lot of times the chenille, uh, Worms are just a little big for the wan. It's not a natural size. So a lot of, a lot of folks come in, got buy a bunch of San Juan worms, and they do have success, but maybe not as, quite as much as some of these skinnier ones. But this material here is called Spanflex, and uh, you can use it for a number of different purposes. Of course, it's good for a body of a, of a uh, it's like a worm. You could use it the same as the legs on a girdle bug here, which this is actually rubber legs, um, but you could use it for that. I mean, you could use it as a number of different uh, um, uses, but uh, this one is the one we found that's most productive. 
this one is a pattern that's tied by, uh, it was, I think, still tied by a, a guy that's named Brad Miller. He used to work for us. He ties for Umqua. So this is an Umqua pattern. And we tie it in a bunch of different variations. We, I try to tie it the same because it works so well. You see you got a couple of glass beads right there towards the head. And then it's just a, a thread body with this span flex material tied on um, front and back there. I'll go ahead and get that one going. <clears throat> and I use, the, I use the San Juan worm on a lot of other rivers in the area that are more, a little bit higher in elevation. I mean, I think that the San Juan does get some true, you know, worms in it, but there's other places in Colorado, like uh, around Durango, that have a lot more, uh, you know, vegetation, grasses, willow trees, things like that, where I think there's a lot more worms in the water, and then we get these heavy rain flows. And of course, you walk down the, the sidewalk after a heavy rain flow, and all those worms are on the sidewalk. They come out of the ground, and all of a sudden, they're in the, you know, in the, in the footpath. And that's exactly how it ends up on the river. These, these worms get drowned out by all the water, so they come up to the surface and get swept away by the water, and they end up in the river. So a worm pattern, any kind of worm pattern, is a very effective pattern during monsoon season or perhaps you know right before or after a rainstorm you know it's a it's a pattern that yeah, i think a lot of people fish but maybe not at the right time so i'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of uh, fishing those worm patterns in and around uh storms so what i'm putting on here is these killer caddis beads which are these are actually a, a, a midge style. So this is the killer caddis. Um, these come in midge, small, medium, and large, I believe, in the size. They come in a number of different colors. They're very useful for multiple patterns, depending on what you're trying to use it for. But if you're putting a, a little bead on any kind of midge, you're, you're probably not going to use, you know, a small tungsten bead or, you know, maybe like a, you know, a brass bead or something like that. You're going to these gold beads or these uh, glass beads work real well. They add a little bit of weight, but they're they're not so significant that you can't uh, can't really rely on them as actual additional weight, just a little bit. But uh, this killer cat glass beads just give you a little bit of a more of a flash, especially like this time of year or, or in the spring or maybe the winter time when the water's a bit murky. That's what happens in the San Juan. You have uh, the reservoir, you know, the water comes through the dam at the reservoir. Usually in the winter time, you have the reservoir invert or turnover. So you have that cold water, that warm water at the top now becomes colder than the water down below. So that whole reservoir switches. And when it switches like that, that clear water that you expect to come out of a tailwater turns murky. So all of a sudden you have like kind of this milky, it's kind of like a, you know, lime green, kind of like pea soup type of color. It's, it's clear enough, you might, you might get a foot or two of visibility, but typically you're used to three to four feet. So it's just like a little bit of more extra flash that you can kind of count on maybe catching those fish's eye a little bit. When I tie this, I try to get a couple wraps in between the beads and the eye, and then I switch the thread over to the back side, and it's a pretty basic pattern. You just tie, kind of tie the, uh, the thread down to the bottom of, the, sh of the, the bend of the shank there, the bend of the hook, tie your span flex in, and uh, that is about it. Sometimes I'll, like I said, sometimes I'll do it with uh, red, I'll do it with orange. For some other rivers, I might do it with like a, kind of like an olive color. They have it in cream and in ginger. It's quite a unique and versatile uh, thread. Of course, you could use this for rubber legs. You could use this as flashing on a streamer, you know, for some kind of fin type uh, imitation there. So it's really, like I said, it's really quite versatile, and, and we like it a lot. We sell a lot of it at the shop. It's a, it's a product. It helps to sell it because the guy that kind of developed this slide, Brad Miller, uh, guides in the area and definitely uh, is known for this pattern. His dad, Dennis Miller, used to guide up at the, um, or guide and, and, and work at the uh, Willow Fly Anglers up in Almont. And he was kind of famous for a couple patterns as well. They did the, uh, 
the, the Miller's D Midge, and he's got a couple of CDC dry fly patterns. He's a he's a phenomenal tire, phenomenal angler, and uh, we like to certainly use uh, those flies down down in our area for sure. <clears throat> so this this fly I have uh, 70 ultra ultra wire or ultra thread. Um, it works pretty well. It's a, it may be a little bit light. When I was doing my practices at the house, I, you know, of course you kind of pull a little too hard one time and it pink, pops free, right? <laughs> but uh, it's um, it's the right the right color, the right thread there. That never happens during live demos. Oh, good, <laughs> good. That's what I was most worried about. <laughs> oh, I blew it. Um, so I got this span flex. It is cut off. It comes in a nice long sheet like this, and it's got uh, 30 or 40 strands on it. So I just cut off a nice skinny piece here, and probably won't tie or won't tie this whole thing. And I'll probably cut it a little long just to start. Maybe you know two or two or so inches long. I might try. I'll, I'll probably trim it at the end, just kind of depending on it. And uh, you know, with these with these span flex, this this worms constantly you know expanding in and out it's it's getting really long and really skinny and then it's kind of shrinking up and getting a little shorter and a little fatter so the direction of the the span flex is not really significant i mean sometimes i like to most of them i try to get it to come off the back and off the front rather straight but once it hits the water and hits the current it's going to be going all over and that's what we want anyway so i'm not too worried about it looking coming out a certain way sometimes it comes out where I'm like mm, okay that's not ideal for what I was trying to go for but it's good enough sometimes it comes out straight on both ends and I'm like all right that's perfect and of course the fly that is not perfect is the one that gets eaten the most of course right but I have all these flies right up here on this manila, manila envelope if anybody wants to come up later and have a closer look at all these flies here <clears throat> to this guy tied in here. Spanflex stuff is a little bit tricky to kind of maneuver. That right there is pretty good. It's kind of coming off relatively straight off the back. If I can get that coming off pretty straight off the front, I have done a good job. So once I get to this point, I have it tied in go ahead and advance my thread back up here to the top kind of build this area up a little bit just below those those caddis beads and I'm gonna jump over up in front of these beads here and then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna fold this right down over the top not too tight, but I am going to hold it there. Your hat's in the way. Oh, is it? Okay. Good call. Put those away there. <clears throat> fold that over. So I can pinch that guy in here. That works. That's uh, looking pretty good right there. Oops, lost it here. <clears throat> and then of course we'll probably trim both ends there a little bit. Oh, I try to make my worm about maybe an inch, maybe a little more than an inch, just kind of depending. Um, I've tied them where they're real long and a lot of wiggle and everything and they've produced and I've, I've also trimmed them a little bit shorter more as a kind of a elongated midge larva and they've worked so it's just kind of your personal preference on on that there but uh, again a really a really effective pattern particularly you'll find that uh, there's certain areas where you'll have like these you know, kind of gravel bottom, like rocky bottom, and then it'll change to gravel. You know, of all this, like, just a gravel bar. And uh, we found that these, these 
worms work particularly well on these gravel bars. It's like where these worms kind of thrive is these gravel bars. And so um, we'll find these areas and we'll fish and we'll, we won't really produce much on midges or leeches or eggs or anything else. We'll put, tie on one of these uh, worms and it's like instant. You'll see big fish, these big trout come they, they, they specialize in eating these, these, these particular flies. They just like them or they're high in protein, but you'll see, you'll cast it in there and you'll see a big trout. You know, maybe you cast that fly a little bit too far and you'll see that big trout turn and actually swim over a couple feet. You're like, wow, did that fish just eat my fly? Indicator, boom, goes down. You're like, oh my God, he did, you know, right in the side of the mouth. It's not all the time, every time, but it certainly is, uh, there, there's that, that that certainly that time and that place where these these uh, these worms work well. And right now, like when that San Juan uh, River has gone up with this flow, the high water is a great time to fish. You know, it's hard to catch these big fish or any fish on the San Juan when that water has just gone bumped up big time. So we fish, you know. It's not, we're not proud of it. We fish a lot of like more junk, you know, fish big eggs and big leeches and, you know, then these worms are already small, but in big water, these worms are microscopic. Those trout are eating eight inch long earthworms, like the garden worms, you know, they'll come in, their belly's completely stuffed. You take the fly out, they, they kind of regurgitate all over and they are earthworms that are the size of half your arm. I mean, it's amazing. So they eat like crazy. But in, in low water and in clear water, these guys work really, really well. And again, we'll tie these in, in a bunch of different colors. We'll tie these in olive and cream and ginger and uh, of course red and orange and you know, just kind of depends on the day. It's like a lot of times it's like, what, what are they eating? Are they eating black? Are they eating red? Are they eating cream, chocolate? The size of the fly matters some. The type of fly matters some, but a lot of it is the color. A lot of it's the color. You know, I do really, really well on chocolate and black. Those are probably my two first choices for color. If I'm gonna fish a midge, it's gonna be all over red a lot of times. But uh, just fortunate enough to have a lot of experience down there and, and see these things. And you know, you, you try on one particular fly with you know, no expectation, and all of a sudden it's like the hot fly for the day. So you have a tough day a couple weeks later you tie that hot fly on from a couple weeks ago and it produces again like okay now this one's a this one's a staple now so um, but yeah that's the uh, that's the span one worm pretty nice looking fly again lots of variations this one's tied on a size 16 you could probably tie it for some free stones you could probably tie that on a size 12 or maybe a size 10 um, Maybe if you were uh, wanting to go a little bit more stealthy, you could certainly tie that on a size 20 if you wanted to. So, any questions so far or anything? Am I doing all right? Doing great. Good. Good. There again, the, the hooks you're using, your heavy wire. What's that? The hooks you're using are heavy wire. Uh, that one is uh, a 2457. So that one is, uh, that one is also 2X heavy. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I do try to kind of fish with those heavier hooks and, and a lot of the ones that you get maybe from the shop you know it's kind of hard to tell you can look at it and kind of gauge it but uh, a lot of times it's it's hard to know exactly what hook whether it's from Umqua or Blacks or Rainies or you know yeah. Solitude or whoever you're like well that one looks like a looks like a good strong hook but maybe it's it's just a normal gauge that's the certainly the benefit of tying um, your own you kind of know for sure what what's going on with that but uh, so those are kind of like a couple more tailwater type flies. Of course, they would, those would work just as well like on a freestone, particularly during like the late fall, winter, maybe early spring when the bug activity is not too significant. But um, there is a pattern that we fish quite a bit and it produces very, very well. And that's on the freestones. Uh, and it's the girdle bug. You guys heard of the girdle bug? Of course, right? Salmon fly, larva. Um, fortunately for us in Colorado and in the Durango area, we have a lot of rivers in the area that are very well suited for, you know, all, all, all bugs. We got a lot of, you know, caddis, mayflies, probably our two dominant, of course, midges year round. 
but there are a handful of rivers that have a very healthy salmon fly population. So we go out there and, you know, during the winter months and early spring, you can pick a lot of flies up. This is one that we're going to be tying now. It's the, uh, the girdle bug here. And this is just a salmon fly larva. And uh, I show this to people all the time in the shop. And yes? And that's got a barb on it. So are you fishing barb or barbless? Typically, I fish barbless. Yeah. These ones, I have not pinched the barbs. I got these hooks right out of the shop. Um, they do all have barbs on it, but I typically pinch them. Um, a lot of my other nymph patterns that I fish or my jig hooks are like a competition style. So they do have that special point barbless hook. But yeah, we, I, I try to, I, I'm so programmed because like on the San Juan, it's, uh, it's, it's mostly a, well, it is in the quality waters, it's, it's all a, a catch and release, two flies and barbless hooks. So I've just gotten into the habit of pinching all my barbs. As soon as I tie it on, boom, I pinch that barb down. And um, you know, if I catch my shirt, it comes out really nice and easy. If I, I, you know, I get a hook in the ear or something like that, it comes out pretty easy. But uh, yeah, these ones all have barbs on it, but typically I do, I do pinch the barb. I just haven't done it today. Do you usually fish barbless hooks yourself? Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, barbless hooks, ultimately, you get a better hook set because you don't have to penetrate that barb. And of course, it's easier when you're removing the hook because you don't have that barb to pull out. But uh, if you do have the little bit of slack in your line or give that, you know, that fish creates a little bit of space in there, those barbless hooks do, do come out pretty easy. But that's kind of the name of the game. And that's why I like fishing on my other nymph hooks. And there's even some dry fly hooks that we use as well that have that, you know, that kind of the curved shank but it has that real special point in that barbless hook that comes up. And I actually have some in my, in my tying bit in the back there. But uh, the way the curved hook is, it's, uh, it's kind of an innard, you know, inward hook, and it's super sharp. And so if you, if you, if you get a good hook set and you keep the pressure on, I, I very rarely you know, drop fish because I, you know, they come out. Of course, it happens all the time. But you know, on, on, on a normal sense, like yeah, those bar those barbless hooks seem to do just as well or better than a barbed hook. Yeah. <clears throat> Does anybody ever tie the girdle bug? A little bit. Yeah, this one's a fun one. This one's a, a little bit of not a challenge. I say it's a, it's a, it's certainly a fun challenge. You got a lot of rubber legs to deal with and uh, manu maneuver and manipulate. But uh, what we're going to be using today, you guys heard of fulling mill? Fully mill, they're a great company. They have uh, great fly patterns that they produce. You know, streamers is what we like, what we buy a lot of from the shop is streamers from Fully Mill. But um, they do a lot of great like performance style hooks, which uh, competition style, you know, special point barbless, uh, Europe, you, you know, Euro check flies. And um, they uh, have really great tying material. Of course, we get a lot of hooks and beads from these guys. Great company to work for and with, and uh, I don't know, everybody that has bought these hooks from us with Fully Mill has been super impressed with them. They're just a really good quality hook that um, you just uh, don't necessarily get from everybody. Uh, <clears throat> so for this guy, I'm going to change real quick over to my other thread. So here I'm going to use a little bit heavier gauge thread. This one's going to be the 140 Ultra Thread. Um, especially with these little bit bigger hooks, I want to make sure I get some stronger thread to keep all my stuff together here. But uh, has anybody ever caught a really good salmon fly hatch? Like had epic dry fly fishing with these, you know, two inch long dry flies? Yeah. In Yellowstone one year. Good for you. I've hit it once in Colorado. I've, I've been there my whole life and you know, I've caught some fish here and there, but I've never had a true day where I had just epic, you know, everywhere you cast, the fish comes, you know, out of the water like a great white eating a seal after that salmon fly. Just one time and it was something that I will try to catch every year. And it's always de dependent. This year we have so much snow in Colorado that uh, typically it's about now, it's maybe the middle of June until the end of June where we have our, you know, our kind of our salmon fly hatch. 
this year we have so much snow we're in the currently as of today I think we're in about the 800 percent of normal range this whole last two, two or three weeks we should be coming down our snowpack should be dropping which is when we have our, our runoff our snow melt but we've had such cold weather and rain and snow in the high country that our snowpack is actually still going up and so they're warning like lower you know area residents of potential flooding here in the next two weeks like if we get a really hot spell of weather and all this you know three or 30 to 50 inches of snow water equivalent melts we could have pretty good widespread flooding so I've never seen that before in Durango but we'll see if it happens this year but typically um, so I think the salmon fly hatch this year is going to be a little bit later on average than usual but uh, we'll have to kind of wait and see on that um, so on this uh, girdle bug there's a bunch of different variations you can do um, of course the chenille which is I use the uh, the coffee chenille which is this kind of black and coffee colored variegated chenille um, they have a bunch of different colors of chenilles that's the one that we find that re represents the, st the salmon fly the best they have an olive chenille in black they have a yellow and an orange and um, they all work they're you know that the orange or yellow could be a really good imitation for a golden stone um, but uh, we tend to fish a lot more of this black coffee chenille and then uh, you know this could also be tied with a gold bead with a tungsten bead with no bead but typically all of them will have a uh, lead free wrap around the shank as well I have some I'm not going to put it on here today but um, that certainly increases the weight of the fly typically when the salmon flies come off anyway it's you know it's big water usually like when it happens on the animus in Durango all of a sudden one day you're riding your bike down down the river trail and oh my gosh there's a salmon fly it's huge well that salmon fly hatched just the day before but the river's at like 5,000 and it's chocolate brown and you had no idea that you're gonna be fishing like you looked at the animus went okay let's go get our white water raft boat out and go hit the, the white water park you're not thinking fishing so those bugs come off at an unopportune time for the angler so on some of our other tailwaters like on the pine we have a lot a lot of salmon flies in the pine and uh, you know these these salmon flies they don't hatch like the caddis fly or like the mayfly they're a crawler so they're on the bottom of the river in the heavy current under the rocks instead of you know drifting to the surface and hatching out on the surface of the water these bugs crawl on the bottom of the river to the end you know the edge of the river get up on a log on a stump on a tree then they shed it out of their exoskeleton then they get their wings out then they fly so these fish know that if they wait right on the edge of the river that those bugs will come right to them eventually so you'll find these fish feeding on these salmon flies right on the edge of the river so you know a lot of times you got to be in still in, in relatively fast water but uh, you, ha you got to get these flies down on the bottom and of course with the tungsten bead and a, and a lead wrapped body boom boom bottom 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 but you know after you hit bottom four times you're gonna hit that 20 inch brown and it's gonna go <laughs> shooting off down river and then the, and then it's on but uh, yeah these flies uh, I, I show these flies to a lot of people in the shop and I just get a, a, a mixed response like, I've tried that girdle bug and I've never caught a fish on that girdle bug in my life I'll show a picture what you catch that fish on girdle bug just just all depends but um, here we're going to just kind of wrap this thread. Saw salmon fly hatch on the uh, South Fork of the Snake in Idaho. Oh yeah, yeah, the great. Bank was orange. It's uh, if you there catch a really good hatch, it is something. It's yeah. there's so many bugs in the sky yeah. that you can almost hear them flying, but it's like you know, like you know, the attack of the birds. Like all yeah. of a sudden, like this whole <laughs> cloud of bugs comes over and. Of course, the salmon fly in the, in the larva stage. I mean, it it looks like a like an alien. I mean, it's like got this crazy exoskeleton, like a you know, like a a shield or armor all along its body, and you pick it up thinking it's gonna like bite you or sting you or something. And um, yeah, they're a very cool bug, and I know those fish. I mean, if you had the choice to have uh, you know a little tiny side salad or uh, t-bone steak 
I'm going to pick the T-bone steak, of course. And that's what these fish, they know that this, uh, there's a time and a place for these particular flies. And when they are moving and hatching and present, there's nothing else that they'd rather be eating than those things. I had a trip a couple weeks ago, and uh, we ended up catching a few fish in the morning on some, on some nymph stuff, and then we ended up catching a couple more throughout the day, but we didn't catch any real good quality fish. And it was just about the end of the day, and uh, I, was, I was like, okay, let's, let's change it up. Let's put this big girdle bug on here. And, you know, we we're fishing kind of a deeper riffle, and uh, the water is really moving fast. And I knew there was fish in this place, but uh, we weren't really getting to them. So I put on this really heavy girdle bug, and in the last four or five casts of the day, we ended up hooking and fortunately landing about a 21 inch rainbow on a size four girdle bug. And the hook was this big, barbless, right in the side of the mouth. I mean, the thing went out of the water and did like three, four tail dances, ran all the way downstream. It was, a, it was quite insane for a little while there, but we were fortunate to uh, be able to land it. And that was the, the fly that produced uh, the quality fish for the day. And it was, it was just kind of ironic how it happens like that. Yeah, our salmon fly experienced the Yellowstone. I had my kids with me and they would catch the salmon flies off the bushes oh, yeah. and just throw them into the water. <laughs> and watch and, the fish come up. And watch the fish come up and eat them. Oh yeah. I like doing that with the uh, hoppers too. See if there's any fish looking up. Grab a hopper off the bank, toss them in the river and see if you, see if you should be fishing hoppers or not. All right, <laughs> got the shank line there with some thread. Typically, like I said, I, I put some uh, some wire on there, but uh, today this one is a size four, I believe. Four, I think. Yeah, four. size four. And these these uh, fully mill hooks are also just a, a great value. This one is quantity fifty for ten ninety five. So like a lot of Umqua hooks, you get quantity twenty five and they're you know eight nine bucks. Well, this one you get an extra twenty five for a couple bucks more, and they're and they're just really fantastic hooks. So you won't you won't go. You won't be disappointed or go go wrong with them here. So for these rubber legs, obviously there's a lot of different rubber legs out there that you can use depending on what you, what's your preference, what's your time, whether it's hoppers or streamers or anything like that. Here I'm going to use this uh, glitter flutter legs, black barred root beer, um, and uh, you know these ones come in a number of different sizes. The rubber legs out there are like infinite. I mean, there's rubber legs for glitter legs and flashy legs and buggy nymph legs and all kinds of stuff. But uh, I like these brown barred legs. I try, try to keep this fly relatively bland because those salmon fly larvae are pretty bland. They're not flashy. When they hatch, they have that bright orange belly. And so you have like this dark top on the dry fly with this really, really orange belly. That's kind of the, the, uh, kind of the, the, the signature color for those dry flies, but for the, the nymph, you know, straight solid black stone fly pattern is just as effective as anything. But uh, this coffee black has always been, always been good for us. So for this guy, I'm going to put these legs just right around this thread here, kind of even it out a little bit. So I can get these legs kind of the same size Come up here and this is where it's kind of fun with this pattern because you got you get a chance to kind of manipulate this material at first it's gonna not gonna look right to you but you can sort of come around behind these legs and kind of manipulate them come right over that material just a little bit until you get it just the way you want. And that's kind of what we're looking for is kind of these two legs kind of coming, not straight off the back, but a little bit at an angle off the back. And then we're gonna go ahead and tie in some of this coffee chenille. I will strip a little bit of this off here the front just to get a little good tie in point. This guy right along here. Tie it in. Advance 
advance my thread a little ways here. Again, this doesn't have to be perfect because we're going to wrap this chenille all the way up the body here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to advance it just a little less than halfway, somewhere right in there. I'm going to tie in my next set of legs. And these, th this set of legs you want to have not straight back like the tail, but you want to have them just kind of coming a little bit off the, off the side there. And again, I'm just going to kind of tie this guy in just quickly to start here, and then I'll sort of be able to finagle this as we kind of move through it. What I'll do a lot of times here is I'll do kind of a figure eight. I'll kind of come around, you know, one direction, and then I'll come around the other direction to, you know, tie it in proper. Well, that's the whole thing with tying is this manipulation of material. That's kind of what you're looking for there. It's kind of just coming off on a, on a, on a not a true down, but just a little bit backwards um, angle there. Then what we're going to do is just advance it up just a little ways further, just like that. And we're going to go ahead and tie in our middle set of legs. Again, we'll just do it the same way. Tie it in there. This one we're going to try to try if we can to get it coming off perpendicular. So I'm going to pull this guy over. And I'm going to tie it around the leg this way. If I can get this one to kind of come a little bit straighter. Pretty good. A little and these rubber legs, they're kind of a mind of their own, right? They're gonna they're gonna twist and turn whichever way they they kind of are, are set in there. That may be a little bit going forward, but again, when this thing hits the water and it hits the current, that's the idea is these rubber legs go go wild. Give that real lifelike look. So for for the purpose of tying today, you know, I mean it's hard to per to get perfection in tying because there's so many variations and material is going to have the mind of their own a lot of times but you know that's 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 pretty good I mean I'm not too worried about it not being perfect there so when we tie in this uh, third set of legs right here in the middle I want these ones kind of tapering just a little bit towards the front of the fly towards the head here probably right in about there do the same thing tie them in here Cole, there was a, a fly that I used a couple of years ago. I think it was called the Pat's Rubber Leg. This is this is it. Okay. Yeah, it's the Pat's Rubber Leg or Girdle Bug. So just different names for the same yeah, fly. Yeah, it, it could be maybe the person who tied it, like okay. just by manufacturer difference. But the the Pat's Rubber Leg and the Girdle Bug are virtually the same thing. Okay. They may have slightly different variations, different colored legs or different colored body chenille. But yeah, they're, they're, they're basically the same thing. I want to get this guy a little bit more forward here. kind of kept messing with that. Now I got that leg kind of coming off the front there. We'll advance this thread right up to the top. And I'll go ahead and build that head up just a little bit. Right there. Now we're going to go back to the back. We're going to palmer this chenille all the way up to the top here. Nice and tight and consecutive. We'll 
these legs back. Skip right in front of this guy right there. Keep it going. Put these legs back. There we go. See that middle legs now right up right perpendicular? It's perfect. It's a perfect patch rubber leg as long as it catches a fish. No promises until then. Let's get these guys going back forward again. A little bit there. Perfect. Right, come up to the head here. Tie it off. Try not to cut your rubber legs off. I've done that a number of times. Made all this hard work and wrap it and there goes your rubber leg right there. So what we're gonna do is just build this head up just a little bit and then we're gonna tie in one last set of legs which is actually gonna serve as the antenna for these alien looking flies. Again, we're just gonna put this right around here. And this one, a lot, a lot of times I'll start with these with these legs just coming off the back just to kind of get them tied in. And then I'll flip them forward and tie it in behind it to uh, really get those guys in there. There we go. guys just a little bit about the same length there we're ready for our whip finish and that thread color on this guy can be about anything you can use a bright colored thread like a orange or something like that and kind of make them pop a little bit I think most folks use a black or a tan or a brown or something or other. But uh, we've also tied a lot of patterns with this that are like with a hot bead. Put a bright orange bead or a bright pink bead on it. And uh, I don't know. I don't know if the fish think that it's a, you know, mid or a you know, larva eating another egg or if it's just better, they can see it better in the, in the water. But those uh, hot spot or hot beaded flies are a really useful pattern in a lot of different situations. And again, like I said, like I, uh, I didn't bring my zappa gap with me, but typically in all these flies, I just boop, hit it hit with a little piece of uh, glue there on the head, solidify that uh, that tie just a little bit better, and uh, there you have it, the patch rubber leg pattern that uh, looks quite strange but is really really effective so what do you guys think looks great good looks great. good awesome i think that uh almost wraps up the first yeah, hour yeah, right well, there sounds good three minutes uh, thank you good. very much yeah uh, appreciate let's, you guys let's call it here so we can get you some dinner before our, our next session yeah absolutely yeah, good uh is this your this is my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so I, I will take that from you, and while you're getting a bite to eat, I'll get that set up here. Excellent. Any, any special? It's just uh, Do you remember San the Juan the Angler Presentation yeah. oh, 19. Yeah. It's the it's the first one on there. Okay. How Very you doing? Good. In Northern California. We